Shalom and good morning all. We start a new book in our Genesis to Revelation study, the book of Ezra. Today we're doing chapters 1 and 2, which has some history of Ezra, Nehemiah, Israel and Judah, and their entering, leaving Babylon. The book of Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one volume. The Vulgate, a Latin translation of the scripture, was the first edition of the Bible to separate them. But at that time, they were des designated as 1 and 2 Ezra. See my introduction to Nehemiah. Like the book of Daniel, portions of Ezra were written in Aramaic, the language of Babylon. Ezra chapters, chapters 4 verse 8 to chapter 6 verse 18. The, meaning that those parts of the history is for the Babylonians. That is why it is in their language. The book of Ezra recounts the efforts of the exiles who returned from Babylon to rebuild the temple. Under the leadership of Jeshua, or what we call Joshua, the high priest and Zerubbabel, the governor over the region, proper worship and ceremonies associated with it were restored in Jerusalem. Many years later, Ezra arrived in Jerusalem with another group of exiles. Ezra was a very knowledgeable and adept scribe and was commissioned by King Artaxerxes to teach the statutes of the Mosaic law to the people in Israel. While there may have been many groups of exiles that returned to Jerusalem from Babylon, Scripture speaks only of three. The first group returned in 536 BC under the leadership of Zerubbabel, the second in 457 BC under Ezra, and the third in 444 BC under Nehemiah. The book of Ezra tells the first two groups of exiles long periods of time are not covered. However, because only those facts that are relevant to the religious life of Israel are given. This, as is the whole Bible, only talks about Israel, the twelve sons of Jacob, uh, not Christians or Gentiles. Now describe the fact that all those who desired to return to Jerusalem were free to do so. A great number of Jews chose to remain in Babylon. As a result, Babylon became an important center for Jewish learning until the city's decline near the end of the 4th century BC. So some of today's practices came out of Babylon. The prophet Zechariah and Haggai were contemporary with Zerubbabel and Esther. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, he lived not many years later. An excellent understanding of the life of the Jews after the exile can be gained by the collective studying of the books of these individuals along with Ezra and Nehemiah. And you get a good source of this. If you've kept up or caught up the every day of our study, very well done. That is about 135 days of our study, over a third. We should by now have a few dots along the straight line of God's teachings and understanding what he requires or required of former humans and therefore of us today. Possibly even some minor dots in between the bigger dots. He is the same yesterday, today and forever and changes not. In Ezra, Nehemiah and Esther, we will be jumping ahead of the biblical timeline to Judah's, Judah's return from Babylon. These books really come after the book of Daniel. A few points of the, of the basics we should have learned are, number one, from before the foundation of Israel and nation, i.e. Adam, Cain, Abel, Noah and Abraham, we saw the requirements to obey and not to sin against this law um, in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 and 12 for example. So do not just sin against his, his way or against his law, which existed before Israel was formated. Abraham was chosen, as Genesis 26 verse 5 says, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So they were there before Israel. In Hebrews 11 verse 8 it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should have after received for inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whether he went. So we had faith, as in Abraham, faith and works 
before it came to Abraham. So before Israel. And that is also said in uh, Revelation 14, 12. We are not to be just a hearer of the law, word, we are to be a doer. It says that the same in Romans chapters 2, 13 and James 1, verse 1 through. We are to be doers and have the faith. The second point, we should know the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt, of the congregation of Israel, Egypt, um, were instructed to in were instructed to obey God's commandments as a precondition to getting in blessings. And if they did not, they were cursed. Exodus chapter 19 verse 5 says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice and indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people. For all the earth is mine. So disobedience for any reason, as Moses and Aaron's, meant they lost out. The third point, Jew or Gentile are called to be as Ruth, as regards to God, Abraham and Isaac, or as they called Israel. Ruth was a Gentile, says for example in chapters 1 verse 16, thy people shall be my people and thy God my God. So, so today's Christians or any other cannot claim to have a different way. They have to join the way of before. Fourth point, we have just finished the era of of kings and saw that the criteria remained. For example, it says, in, as it summarized in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12 14, if you will fear Yahweh and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandments of Yahweh, then shall both you and also the king that reign over you continue following Yahweh your God. But if you will not obey the voice of Yahweh, but rebel against the commandment of Yahweh, then shall the hand of Yahweh be against you, as it was against your fathers. First Chronicles 28 verse 9, And thou, Solomon, my son, know that thou, the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, for Yahweh searcheth all the hearts and understandeth all the imagination of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. That's what David told Solomon. The failure to keep to that criteria, which formed the covenant of Exodus chapter 24, verse 7, which says, All that Yahweh hath said we will do and be obedient, led them to be where they ended in exile. So we just read that in Kings and Chronicles, both Israel and now Judah. Israel scattered as lost sheep by the Syrians and Judah in Babylon for 70 years. Disobedience by individual or king for any reason meant they lost out, as did Moses. As I said, God is not a respecter of persons, nor change his criteria. 1 Samuel chapters 13 verse 13 and 15 verse 13 gives us this concept. It says, to obey is better than sacrifice. So praise and worship and all these things does not replace our, our requirements to obey. Second Samuel chapter 6 verse 7 and First Kings chapter 13 26 says those things. So which part of all do we today not understand? We may not murder, steal, etc. And, and be doing all the rest except for one or two things. But the all means all. Correct those one or two or few things you are not just mentioned and you will be doing the all. In life and in salvation we are not rewarded for the laws we keep or the good we have done but punished for the ones we do not. Remember you were, as when people came to Yeshua and said Lord, Lord, we've done all these good things in thy name but you were, Yeshua said they were doing iniquity. That's because they did not repent of the one, two or few things they were not doing. So as I said again, in life we are punished for what we do not do, not rewarded for what we do do. Are you keeping the correct Exodus 20 verse 8 and Exodus 23 verse 14 and Leviticus verse 23? If not, read them. Man cannot change those, nor get rid of them or go by what Paul said about them, only what God instructed to be done. They form part of the all and may be your downfall. Man may give you numerous reasons not to, but as Peter said in Acts 5.29, 5, 
we then then Peter and all the apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men, whether they're pastors or whoever. We today are the same congregation or church as the school of the Bible as Moses brought out of the wilderness. Acts chapter seven thirty eight says, This is he or I should say we should be the same. Um, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the congregation, so with angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So I said church means congregation. And the Holy, Script, Holy Spirit does not tell us to do anything different. First we obey, then we get the Holy Spirit. Not get it in a disobedience, nor to change our nor change our obedience. Acts chapter 5, verse, that's what people claim. Acts chapter 5, 32 says, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. A verse we should learn off by heart. Therefore, we, so we do not claim, or some not claim, they have the Holy Spirit when they clearly do not do all of what God asks of us, or the congregation, the church to do. Okay, coming on to congregation, or Ezra chapter 1, the propagation of Cyrus. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of Yahweh by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, Yahweh set up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus king of Persia, Yahweh God of heaven hath given me all of the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of Yahweh God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem. Verse 4. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, or liveth, let the men of his place help him with silver, and with gold, and with goods, and with beasts, besides a freewill offering for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Verse 11. All the vessels of gold and of silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbaza bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon unto Jerusalem. So my note, to bring about what he, God said, he said it would occur, and in this case by whom he said it would be happen. Stir up the spirit of Cyrus, is what God did, to proclaim the people of Israel could return back and take back the vessels of the temple. Something he said that would happen in the book of Jeremiah. Daniel foresaw it, and it is now happening. happening. Moving on to chapter 2, verse 1. <coughs> the exiles return. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon had carried away unto Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city, which came with Zer Zer Zerubbabel, Yeshua, um, just Joshua, or who we translate as Joshua, Nehemiah, Sarahiah, Relia, Mordecai, Bishan, Mizpah, Bigvai, Rehan, Bana, the number of the men of the people of Israel. Jump to verse 61. And the children of the priests, the children of Habariah, the children of Koz, the children of Basilia, which took a wife of the daughters of Basilia, the Gileadite, the Gileadite, and was called after their name. Verse 62. These sought their register among those that were reckoned by the genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore were they as polluted from the priesthood. And Tashatha said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till they stood up a priest with Urim and with Thummim. The whole congregation together was forty and two thousand and three hundred and three score. Verse 65, beside their servants, 
and their maids of whom there were 7,337, and there were among them 200 singing men with singing women. Verse 70. So the priests and the Levites, um, some of the people, and the singers and the porters and the Netherims dwelt in their cities and all Israel in their cities. So what is happening is people are going back, um, including some of the priests. But to be a priest, you have to prove your genealogy. And if they couldn't prove their gene genealogy, they weren't allowed to be priests and eat of the holy things because they would be breaking God's laws. So you see, they are still keeping or trying to keep God's laws. So we will read of Mordecai in the book of Esther. He's one who went who saved Israel in a sense, or Judah, should I say. Note to be a priest and to eat the holy things, as I said, you had to establish your gene genealogy. However, the most important thing to note is the pronunciation of the names did not change between languages. Now, they may have been spelt differently, as we just spelt them in English, but they were pronounced the same. This, or below, is an extract from an article titled Yeshua or Jesus which can be read on the website forwardtoyahweh.com. Now the deceivers manipulated into translations a change in pronunciation for a purpose, his purpose. So we do not call it a true pronunciation of God or his son's name. We should return to these same pronunciation. Now, if you read, for example, Ezra chapters 2, verse 8 to 10, you will see the names remain as pronounced in Hebrew. The number, if you have a concordance, you can download it from the website called eSword, letter E a dash and sword, S W O R D, I think it's dot org. It will give you um, the Hebrew, original Hebrew words for each translated English word. And if you look at the concordance, um, you'll see that the Hebrew names have certain numerical numbers, and they are below. And even though you'll see the word, the name written in Hebrew, in Hebrew letters, when translated, you'll see it's pronounced exactly the same, whether, it's you, whether you're reading it out of the Hebrew writing or the English translation writing, it's pronounced the same. So, for example, Ezra chapter 2, it says the children of Zatu, and it has a numerical number of 2240, and it's still pronounced Zatu when spelled Z-A-T-T-U. Um, the children of Zakai, Numerical number H2140 still pronounced Zakai, although spelt Z A C C A I, or how you want to put it. You can even spell it Z A K if you want to, um, to get the Zak um, and the Kai. So it's not the spelling that counts for the pronunciation. So there's, those are the examples for you to see on the screen. But you can get a full article, as I said, from 40yahweh.com. So if you look, for example, at this H240. There's a Hebrew um, writing of it there, and it's pronounced Zakai, and we can spell it in English Z A K K A H W E, and we still pronounce it Zakai, whether we spell it that way or not, and so on. So I said I leave you to look at their full teaching. But the main point is we should not be changing um, Yahweh to Lord, and we shouldn't be changing Yeshua to um, to Jesus. So even when one comes to the name Melchizedek in a Bible, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 8, verse 14, it is still Melchizedek in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 15. It remains pronounced similar in Hebrew as in Greek. So in the Old Testament, in Genesis 8, 14, it's in Hebrew. In the New Testament, it is in Greek, and yet it's pronounced the same. Also note that the name of sound carries over into translations. And they have certain meanings. Hebrew names carry specific meanings as, the, as names do in many languages. The sound of Yahweh and Yeshua also carry certain meanings, whether deliverer, saviour, merciful, or other things. I Yeshua translates into Yah, meaning God, is our saviour, among other things he is. Now this cannot be said of the sound Jesus. Also the sound Baal. I in Judges chapter 6 verse 25 says, And it came to pass the same night that Yahweh said unto him, Take thy father's do correction there, young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal. 
numerical reference, 1168. That retains the same or similar pronunciation in Hebrew. When we come to Greek and English, it is still Baal or Baal, where this, how it's spelled. So, who, what is Baal? Baal or Baal is a Phoenician deity, a Phoenician god, a pagan god. And I say it's um, Baal or Baalim means lords, and Baal actually means lords. Again, you can see the full article um, we have directed you on 40 yard way. I'm just going to go back to our study for today. Now, one last point. Within the name or sound goes the spirit of the God of whom it is associated. So, we had Baal Pura when we had some things in the Old Testament and so on. And we know, we see that the spirit goes in that name. That's why we shouldn't change the name Yeshua or Yahweh to another one like Jesus. If we see Daniel, chapters 1, verse 7, you read your Bible, and verses 4, 8, and 9, we read, but this is what the king was saying to Daniel, but at, that, but at the last Daniel came in before me, whose name were, was Belshazzar, according to the name of my God. So that's why they changed Daniel and his three Hebrew boys' names, so that they wouldn't have the names of their gods, but the name of the pagan gods, the Babylon gods. And it goes on to say, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods? Whose holy gods? His, my, Babylon's holy gods. Daniel chapter 4 verse 9. Belshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. So that's why they changed their names. And that's also why God changed the name Abraham and Sarah to a name that associated with him. Now you, as I, may constantly hear foreigners speaking in their language, then insert an English name of a person or item as electricity, or a brand name as Microsoft, or a place to meet as in Manhattan Station if in America. So the, even though they may be speaking in their language, but it's, when they come to that word, they do not translate it or transliterate it. They still say Manhattan Station or Microsoft and so forth. If you look at the Olympics, you will see... Of all the people that come around from the world, around the world, their names are still pronounced the same way it's pronounced in their own country in their own language. So God wants us to, to call the sound of his and his son's name. Yahweh or Yehovah, or quanta you want to pronounce it, and Yeshua. Not change the sound by translating or transliterating it into another sound. As for the argument that even those who call the name spell or pronounce it differently, as I said before, um, it's not the spelling that counts, it's the pronunciation. Yahweh can spell Y-A-H-W-E-H, Y-A-W-V-E-H. Yeshua can be spelled Y-E-S-S-H-U-A or Y-A-H. Yeah, some say Yeshua, some say Yeshua. It is a pronunciation, but it's definitely not Jesus or a similar minor spelling. It is common when trying to recreate a certain sound of another language to spell it differently. Even English-sounding names are spelled differently. There, or there, Rihanna can be spelled with R-I, or it can be spelled with R-Y. Reese could be a name could be spelled with R W E C E or R E I C. It's still pronounced Reese, or R W E S E. Some of you pronounce it. Jonathan, J O N or J O H N, and so on. So the correct sound is more important than the spelling. One learns to spell according to the sound. Now I have seen dictionaries which have a different spelling to a word next to it to aid pronunciation. Some call it phonics. When you're teaching a child to spell or pronounce it, um, in some English teach schools it's called phonics. So consonant in your dictionary may have to aid your pronunciation of it. K-O-N, so you pronounce the con rather than C-O-N, and sonant. So the point is, it's not the spelling that counts, it's the pronunciation. In the names of coins remain as the American cent, the dollar, the English penny or pounds, yes, UP, European euro, etc. Now, specifically in the Bible, this is also true of the gera and the shekel. We have not changed their name of equivalent in the English translation to dollars or cents or so forth. It still remains the gera or the shekel. And those are the Bible references, Exodus 30. 13, Leviticus 27, 25, Numbers 3, 27, and so on. 
Now, I could give numerous examples of names of things that remain the same when pronouncing other languages as um, Bergione, I think that's the name of a wine, if I'm pronouncing it right, white, white wine, or Mahjong, the Chinese board game, or martial arts techniques, if you do martial arts, it'd be the same um, name in any language. Now, imagine two strangers meeting, on, meeting and not speaking each other's language. Each points to themselves and recites their name, Robinson Crusoe, or Tarzan, to go by a, a store, um, international story. That name sticks and does not get transliterated. So when the next person goes on to say, oh, I just met the man, his name was Robinson Crusoe, or Tarzan, they do, they do not change the name. So the point I wish you to take away from this today's lesson um, is we should not be changing the names and the Ezra chapters 2 proves that. Shalom until tomorrow, God willing.